Good evening, and thank you all so much for being here. I heard this morning it's, it's jazz hands hello, so everyone, everyone has a jazz hands. Um, and double brave for braving this uh, very bad weather, but a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, I'm Jennifer Rabb, and I have the incredible privilege of serving as the president of the extraordinary Hunter College, the place where the American dream still comes true. Um, on behalf of our Jonathan Fanton Director of Roosevelt House, Harold Holzer, it is really a great pleasure to welcome you to this special conference to mark the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, 2020 Gender, Race, Suffrage, and Citizenship, presented by Hunter's Department of Women and Gender Studies in collaboration with Roosevelt House Public Policy and Human Rights Programs. And I want to say first a really very special, I can't see her over the monitor, uh, thank you. And I think we have to give a really great round of applause to Catherine Rassinger, our Chair of Women and Gender Studies. Uh, this was really her brainstorm and her baby, and she's been planning it, and just with such uh, commitment, intelligence, and vision. So really, thank you so much, Catherine. And then, of course, to our partners at Roosevelt House, Shama Venkateswar and Jessica Newworth for all of your vision and creativity in planning this conference, so thank you. Over tonight and tomorrow, the, you as our participants will have a chance to think deeply and critically about the struggle for women's suffrage, celebrating what was achieved while also marking the complexities of that achievement. The conference will also consider what has happened since the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920 and how voting rights have continued to be threatened and protected throughout the century. You'll hear not just from leading experts on the history of women's suffrage, but advocates for the new, bold, democratic engagement and elected officials who have shown a commitment to the advancement of voting and women's rights. In this conference, participants will look back at the past in order for us to all look ahead to the future. Fittingly, the Women's Suffrage Centennial comes during a time for Hunter College which was founded 150 years ago this year as one of the first all-women colleges in this country to educate women. Thomas Hunter had a vision. He felt that teachers should not be 13 or 14-year-old girls who came back the next few weeks after graduating and showed up at the head of the classroom. He believed deeply that women should be educated and that teachers who were mostly women should receive two years of content knowledge, a year of pedagogical training, and like a physician, a clinical experience. And he had a real dream about access as well as empowering women. He believed that all women, rich and poor, all races and religions should get a chance to advance themselves. He once said in somewhat old-fashioned language that the Negro will sit next to the Jew who will sit next to the Gentile. So old-fashioned in 1870, but what an extraordinary vision that we still today embrace at Hunter College, access and opportunity for women. And of course, we could, there'd be no more appropriate place to have this event than our own Roosevelt House. This house, which was Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt received as a combination wedding and Christmas present from his Sarah, mother Sarah back in 1908. Franklin recovered from polio here, went on to run his 1928 gubernatorial campaign from here, and then four years later ran for president and came home in the evening of November 8, 1932 as the president-elect. He used this as his transition headquarters because in that time, the inauguration was not until March. So from November through March of 1933, this is where the Brain Trust met. This is where, where the New Deal was formed. And perhaps most significantly tonight, to tonight's event, this is where Franklin Roosevelt asked Frances Perkins to become the very first woman to serve in a United States cabinet. Frances Perkins, however, was a bit feisty, and she told Roosevelt upstairs in the library that she would not accept this offer to become the first woman cabinet secretary unless he agreed to create a social safety net for this country. So it was in this house where they agreed to expand the model program of old age pensions they had introduced in Albany a, to, into a program that we now know as Social Security. They added to the reform program critical legislation such as minimum wage and child labor laws. The outlines of the rest of the New Deal were also devised by the Brain Trust that ups met upstairs in that same room that we now use that was President FDR's library. 
It was also in this house that Eleanor Roosevelt became the global voice for women and human rights, which later guided the Universal Declaration of Human Rights toward the adoption by the United Nations. Perhaps less heralded, but no less significant, was Eleanor's role as a formative leader of the League of Women Voters. After the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920, the same year that Franklin Roosevelt ran for vice president, and of course the same year as the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Eleanor helped establish the League's agenda. She lobbied tirelessly for reforms in Congress and worked to strengthen women's roles in politics. She helped mobilize women voters through the League's nonpartisan training and lobbying work. When it came to politics, Eleanor was driven by a deep belief that women deserved a place at the table. Her work to empower women's participation as voters and political leaders only strengthened after her husband won the presidency in 1933. She campaigned for Roosevelt's administration to hire women for executive appointments and held press conferences to inform women voters, urging women to speak their minds and engage on policy issues. And after Eleanor left the White House in 1945, she continued to promote women's equality through her work not only with the League of Women Voters, but also through her work with groups like the NAACP. Tonight's event is animated by that history and by the history of this house a history that takes us deep into the legacy of women as active participants in governments. So as the, one of the nation's first women colleges, a place where all women of, women of all races and religions and classes, a women that, a place that is the home of the only two women, only place to have two women Nobel Prize winners in medicine in their alumni body, it is so appropriate for me to be able to welcome you on behalf of Hunter College and Roosevelt House to this very important evening and this very important discussion. Catherine, what you and your team have done here really helps Hunter live our motto, mihi cura futuri, the care of the future is mine. It is a pleasure now also to introduce tonight's keynote speaker and to welcome Dr. Ro Barbara Ransby. Barbara Ransby is a scholar, a teacher, a mentor, and a longtime activist. She is the author of the award-winning biography, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, as well as Eslanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson, and Making Black Lives Matter, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century. Professor Ransby is the 2018 recipient of the Angela Davis Award for Public Scholarship from the American Studies Association and is currently a distinguished professor of gender and women's studies, African American studies, and history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Professor Ransby was among the handful of black women recognized by the New York Times as having changed the landscape of Chicago politics. Her long and extremely impressive resume is enclosed in our package. So I wanted to add some words from our Provost Lon Kaufman who knew, who's known Barbara for quite a while and is not with us tonight due to a family emergency. Lon says, quote, Barbara is unique. She's a true and respected scholar. Her writings are recognized by her colleagues as among the most significant in the discipline. She is a gifted teacher and mentor, and she is filled care, with care and patience. She is also a full-on success in patient activist a policy change agent who, along with a handful of activist colleagues, changed the political landscape of Chicago, a task not for the faint of heart. It is proper she presents here tonight at Roosevelt House. Barbara, like Roosevelt House, is about active work on policy change, development, and implementation informed by scholarship. Lon says, I worked with Barbara on several projects, including UIC's diversity strategic thinking and planning process and documents, the UIC Justice Initiative, which grew out of a conversation about STEM pipelines. I'll leave you to figure out that one. Before he asked her to come into the provost's office as the vice provost for diversity, we had by then, he says, developed a fond and certain trust. So I remember when I asked Barbara if she would serve as vice provost. She leaned over the large Mission Oak conference table in the provost's office and in the most caring and sensitive way said, you know, Lon, I am an activist. That care and that sense of protection also defines Barbara. Lon leaves us with this final thought. I will be forever grateful for her friendship and support during some very trying times. So it is great honor for Barbara for, you to for us to have you here tonight and to hear you speak. So we have such a pleasure to welcome you to the podium for tonight's keynote speech.
thank you. Thank you for that very kind um, introduction and words from my old friend Lon Kaufman. Uh, it's nice to see a full auditorium on this soggy, nasty New York night, right? But New Yorkers are tough, so I expected this. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, you know, thank you again, President Rob, for uh, the work you do here and your leadership. Um, Thank you to Catherine. Uh, the, this is this is a bit of a barrier, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, thank you to uh, Catherine Rossigier and her colleagues in the Women uh, and Gender Studies uh, Department for the invitation, um, and thank you, you know, really for the organizers of this event. The entire, you know, tonight and tomorrow, um, this conference on <coughs> gender suffrage, race, and citizenship. I'm delighted to be able to offer some remarks that can kick off. Uh, tomorrow's discussions, and I look forward to the conversation afterwards uh, with Professor Alcoff and with the audience. Um, I also want to preface my remarks by remembering a dear friend and colleague who worked on this topic, uh, who we uh, gathered and discussed issues of um, black women's role in the suffrage movement, how we remember the suffrage movement, and I'm thinking about um, Dr. Rosalind Turboy Penn who died uh, in a little over a year ago. She was a pre professor at Morgan State for many years, a leader of the Association of Black Women Historians and the um, uh, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, and really, she was our dean of African American women in the suffrage movement. And so I'm thinking of her book, African American Women in the Struggle for the Vote, uh, that came out in 1998. So when I was preparing these remarks and thinking about this today, I very much wanted to bring her um, memory and spirit into the room. Um, and before, uh, before I get into my remarks proper, I also want to acknowledge the really amazing program. Um, I kept saying, is everyone confirmed? Are all those people coming? Some really brilliant um, thinkers. Uh, my dear friend Beverly Guy Sheftal, uh, who runs the Women's Center at Spelman, is our reigning dean of black feminist thought. Um, and Dr. Ruth Wilson, uh, Wilson Gilmore, a scholar, activist, uh, and amazing um, thinker, and activist Erica Miner, who is, you know, these are only a few of the number of people who are going to be on the program tomorrow. So I'm really honored to be uh, kicking off a discussion with such a stellar uh, roster of, of speakers. I want to do a couple of things in my comments tonight. Uh, I want to leave plenty of time for conversation. But I want to offer some reflections on the 19th century and early 20th century women's suffrage movement. Uh, I want to also offer some reflections on black feminist work in the electoral arena uh, today, both as a researcher. Uh, my last book was on the movement for black lives and the way in which young black feminists have led that movement, inspired that movement, shaped that movement, um, and also my participation um, in it as well. In the words of the great black woman suffrage uh, leader and anti-lynching crusader, Ida B. Wells Barnett, I want to trouble the waters a bit. I want to trouble the waters about how we think about the past, particularly our gendered past. And I want to trouble the waters about how we engage in the present. Fortunately, my colleagues here at Hunter have already started that process of troubling the waters simply in how they've chosen to title this gathering. And I'm always happy to be among intellectual troublemakers. Um, you see, this could have been a conference simply on the 19th Amendment, a kind of uh, centennial celebration. This could have been a Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton remembered celebration. Or, or it could have simply been a muted and intellectually agnostic rubric like how women got the vote. But they chose to title it, as they did, Gender, Race, Suffrage, and Citizenship which is both an invitation and a provocation. The title suggests we cannot fairly or fully talk about the subject of woman suffrage without also talking about issues of race, issues of class, and issues of power. In essence, there is no such thing as a race-neutral conversation about suffrage, woman suffrage or otherwise, <clears throat> at least not an honest conversation. From the very beginning of the Republic, not only was gender a critical variable in determining who was or was not a citizen, but of course so was race. Who is or is not rational enough to exercise the vote? Who is or is not, in the case of black people, even fully human? These were the questions that sullied and corrupted the project of American de democracy at the very outset. And I just want to also remember and applaud the really important work 
uh, that folks over the New York Times did and the wonderful journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones uh, for last year's 1619 project, which really went a long way in raising some of these critical questions, inconvenient questions in some circles uh, for a larger non-academic public. What all this boils down to is that in order to talk about race and woman suffrage, we have to talk about this concept of intersectionality. Now, whenever I invoke the term inter intersectionality, I always have to bracket it by saying um, that I'm very mindful that our friend and colleague, uh, critical race scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, named it, uh, in a, of course, in a landmark article in 1991, but she did not invent it. Simply put, an intersectional approach is one that understands the symbiotic relationship between race, class, gender, and sexuality in our lives and in the dominant structures and institutions of our society. It was embodied in Sojourner Truth's now infamous Aren't I a Woman speech in 1851. It was embodied in the research and writings and teachings of Angela Davis in the 1970s, 80s, and since. And it is, of course, reflected in the language of the path-breaking Combahee River Collective Statement from 1974. So let me wade into our larger discussion <clears throat> by sharing three simple stories about race, gender, suffrage, and citizenship. Story one. In 1913, Ida B. Wells Barnett went to the National March for Women's Suffrage in Washington, D.C. She, she arrived dressed for the occasion, elegantly clad head to toe. She had spent many hours on a train to get there, and when she arrived, she was not ready for nonsense. She arrived to represent the newly formed Chicago-based uh, Alpha Suffrage Club, a black women's organization. When she got there, however, she was asked very kindly uh, by the organizers of the march that she should go to the back of the march where all the colored ladies would be gathering. This did not sit well with Ida B. Wells Barnett. And this will not surprise you if any of you have read uh, Paula Giddings' um, uh, absolutely wonderful uh, biography of Ida B. Wells. So she refused and instead marched defiantly with the predominantly white Illinois delegation closer to the front of the march. This story raises questions about principal coalition, who defines the parameters of those coalition, and also echoes another incident in the early 1970s in which a group of black women from the Third World Women's Alliance, uh, some of them, were asked to leave uh, a women's liberation march because they were uh, carrying a poster in support of freeing Angela Davis. They had a similar response that Ida B. Wells did. The second story I want to share is that of Lula Murray of Jefferson County, Alabama. Lula Murray, uh, who in 1923 penned an eloquent and angry letter to then President Calvin Coolidge, expressing her outrage at having been turned away at the polls near her home. This was, of course, three years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. She saw this as a violation of not one, but three constitutional amendments, the 14th, 15th, and 19th. In the formulation of her grievance, she illustrated the integral connections between the claims of two marginalized groups, both of which she claimed membership in, African Americans and women, another example of intersectionality unnamed. Her fate was tied to both the claim for women's rights and the struggle for black freedom. For the third story, I wanna to turn to the scholarship of historian uh, Elsa Barkley Brown who writes about the process of black people forming and contributing to constitutional conventions during Reconstruction and the way in which black communities experimented with and ultimately forged alternative and insurgent definitions of suffrage, democracy, and citizenship. And here is how Elsa Barkley Brown illustrates the point. Even though the 15th Amendment only gave me black men the right to vote, the community all of whom, of course, had been dispossessed and disenfranchised before the war, had a very liberal and fluid notion of who could and could not cast a ballot and to whom the, the ballot actually belonged. In their collective view, it did not, Brown argues, belong solely to individuals, but to community. So at many neighborhood, rural, and family meetings uh, that were the precursors to the constitutional conventions, women voted, and children over the age of 12 all voted on how men should, should cast the collectively claimed ballots. 
There was no enforcement power or accountability mechanisms, of course. But it was significant that many women and their children often accompanied male family members to the polls to cast their votes. We can only imagine looking to make sure that the individual vote was actually the collective one. So oppressed people leverage power in creative ways, sometimes defying the logic of dominant systems. I tell these three stories to underscore the messy, layered, and complicated nature of the struggle for voting rights and the exercise of the franchise itself, a struggle which was never simple, never straightforward, and never one-dimensional. So in this centennial year of the 19th Amendment, we can recognize and remember those who advocated for the rights of women to vote, in many cases, the right of white women to vote, but let's do so in its complexity and in its messiness. Let's also engage the implications for today. Yes, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and the Seneca Falls women were brazen and courageous and forward-looking. Yes, Alice Paul was formidable and unflappable in her pursuit of the ballot for white women. And yes, black suffragists like Frances E. W. Harper, Adele Logan, and Mary Ann Shad Carey made enormous contributions in the fight to pass the 19th Amendment on, on paper, which on paper gave all women the constitutionally protected right to vote. We can indeed admire many aspects of the overall struggle, the effort to stretch and expand American democracy, but we cannot do so uncritically because their stories are only part of a larger story and we often hear only parts of their stories. The fact is the women's suffrage movement from Seneca Falls to the post-Civil War fight for the very meaning of democracy, to the struggle around voter suppression and the right of women and people of color to be full-fledged partners in the political process, has been and continues to be steeped in and inseparable from, from struggles around race, class, and specifically anti-blackness. In all of this, it is important to remember the origins of the women's suffrage movement in the abolitionist movement to end slavery, where many of the first wave feminists cut their political teeth. White women suffragists worked alongside formerly enslaved people like Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass, arguing for the end of the inhumane and unjust system of chattel slavery. After the Civil War was over, the fragile alliance between the women's rights movement and the movement for black freedom began to unravel. Black women seemingly caught in the middle. As the new post-emancipation forms were put in place by the anti-slavery Republican Party, the terms of a recalibrated democracy were being hashed out. The passage of the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution gave formerly enslaved people citizenship status. The 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote. It of course proved to be temporary but for a solid decade, it was real and it was protected. It was, as a great scholar activist W.B. Du Bois termed it, the great experiment in interracial democracy. But it was also the first time that the word male was actually inserted into the Constitution. Some of the women activists felt, some of the white women activists felt betrayed. They wanted universal suffrage and were insulted that black men would be given the vote before educated white women. Now the pushback, as many of you know from Frederick Douglass and Lucy Stone and a plethora of black women suffragists, was that it was incremental, that there was, uh, that there was a public will in the wake of the war to enfranchise at least some portion of the formerly enslaved population and that the fight for universal suffrage would continue. They also argued that the vote, even in limited form, would or could give black people protection from the rampant vigilante violence. Uh, that characterized the period after the war. Even though all surf suffrages early on leaned toward universal suffrage, some settled for the compromise, but others were simply not having it. But how they challenged the 15th Amendment is very important. What started as a tactical difference devolved into an ideological and political one as one wing of the movement increasingly relied on racist arguments to bolster the demand for white woman suffrage. The movement split into two competing organizations, one that supported the 15th Amendment and one that opposed it because it did not go far enough. But it wasn't as simple as that. Racism quickly kicked in with a vengeance, 
a racism that must have been lurking under the surface of a kind of maternal white liberalism all along. In criticizing the exclusion of women from the 15th Amendment, Elizabeth Cady Stanton famously remarked, now that the gates of the kingdom are open, this is a paraphrasing, um, uh, are we going to stand aside while Sambo walks in? Susan B. Anthony began to work with the eccentric and wealthy pro-slavery racist George Francis Train in order to get funding for the, for the women's rights magazine Revolution. By the early 1900s, Carrie Chapman Catt, then leader of the National American Woman Suffrage Association and later founder of the League of Women Voters, went even further. In making the case for giving women, by that she meant white women, the vote, White supremacy, she said, will be strengthened, not weakened, by woman suffrage. Now, there are twists and turns of interpretation that say she didn't really mean that, but it does actually sound pretty straightforward. Um, now, this was after poll taxes, literary tests, and all-white primaries and various forms of unchecked economic coercion, not to mention white vigilante violence, had already effectively disenfranchised the overwhelming majority uh, of black citizens, male and female. Into that very charged and very racist electoral void, she reasoned, white women would add to the white vote, and implicitly that the exclusionary measures that had been taken throughout the South to exclude black men from the polls would remain in place. So the racist impulse between the women's, within the women's suffrage movement went from Stanton, a one-time abolitionist, succumbing to anti-black racism because of her outrage at not being included in the post-war expansion of the vote, to Carrie Chapman Catt's very deliberate use of racism uh, and the lure of white supremacy to argue for white woman suffrage as a tool and to also offset the political influence of black male voters, those who still had the vote. So what about these historical lessons? What can we extract from this? One, uh, if movements don't have a political, uh, a politic of radical inclusion a holistic politics that gr politic that grounds their work, then expedient self-interest is bound to take hold, and it is a slippery slope from there. Secondly, we have to resist the seduction of sanitized histories that might make us temporarily feel good about heroes and sheroes, but ultimately come back to haunt us. There are no perfect historical subjects, no saviors, and no saints. And finally, let's not fetishize or romanticize the ballot even when women were able to cast a vote, even when black men and later women were legally able to vote, <clears throat> it was conditional power, conditional upon sometimes not acting in the full interest of the entire ostracized or excluded group. Now, fast forward to 2020. I want to shift gears a bit. And I want to talk about the political realities of today as they relate to these themes of race, gender, citizenship, and electoral politics. I want to share some of my research on the movement for black lives and some of my own current feminist praxis. First of all, to locate us in time. In 2012, after the murder of young Trayvon Martin uh, uh, in Florida, and the uprising and sustained protests against police violence that followed, uh, followed by, excuse me, followed by the murder of Mike Brown in 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri, we saw an intense, an in intense uh, and sustained upsurge in the Black Freedom Movement, one of the largest uh, series of protests in a half century. Thousands of people marched, sat in, stopped traffic on major freeways, were arrested and engaged in all manner of creative forms of protest. Most significant for our conversation today, some of the most prominent, intentional, influential leaders that came out of what was termed the Black Lives Matter movement and later morphed into the movement for black lives were young black feminists, many of them queer, and some of them embracing their own form of abolitionism, inspired by people like uh, Ruth Gilmore, Angela Davis, and others. They were tackling the structures of the racist prison system, seeing police as a part of that, but also building alternatives. I want to talk about three aspects of that movement as a way to inform how we think of uh, questions of gender, race, and citizenship today. 
One is the origins of the movement for black lives, and a movement for black lives is a larger constellation of organizations that emerged out of the Black Lives Matter uh, protests. Black Lives Matter Global Network is one organization in that, in that coalition. Secondly, I want to shift to talk about their shift to electoral work uh, from, from being um, very, very skeptical about it initially and, and how they've sort of changed the terms of that work. And finally, I want to um, just make some observations about the differences between the early 20th century struggles um, and some of the leadership emergent today. In terms of the origins, uh, sometimes we talk about social movements as if they emerge out of thin air, and of course they don't. There's always a prologue to the prologue. I was very interested to ask many of the young activists in the Movement for Black Lives that I interviewed in 2016 and 2017 uh, and early 2018, what was their inspiration? Where did they uh, look to form a worldview that framed their activism and their understanding of both what they were up against, but also what they were for? Two organizations stood out. One is Critical Resistance, um, an abolitionist organization that emerged as a, uh, uh, opposi in opposition to the growing prison industry. R Ruth Gilmore is one of the founders of that um, movement and organization. And the other was Insight, Women of Color Against Violence. And these are organizations really steeped in a black feminist praxis and a black feminist um, understanding of um, intersectionality. Another organization that emerges early on after the murder of Trayvon Martin is an organization called the Black Youth Project 100. It is uh, initially midwifed by Kathy Cohen. Uh, Kathy Cohen is a scholar activist, um, an LGBTQ activist in Chicago, um, researcher who did a lot of work around the black community and the AIDS crisis. Uh, but she created space to kind of incubate this organization. And then as a well-behaved elder, uh, she stepped aside and let them uh, do their work. And BYP 100 has explicitly focused on issues of state violence, economic and racial injustice, but they do so through what they describe as a black, queer, feminist lens. So at the center of a movement defining black freedom and racial justice very broadly, we have these activists who clearly are coming out of an intersectional framework, a holistic framework uh, that defines the interrelated nature um, of all of these social problems. Another campaign that's important to mention is the Say Her Name campaign. Kimberly Crenshaw, along with some of the Black Lives Matter organizers, BYP 100 included, uh, really wanted to make an intervention in a movement and a set of uh, campaigns that were really largely focused on the deaths of, of black men, uh, black men who were being killed by the police, some of the most prominent cases, and basically, without taking away from the violence and the injustice of those cases, they said there are, there are a whole long list of names of black women, including queer black women and trans women, um, who have also been victims of state violence, and asked crowds and asked audiences to know their names, to say their names, to bring that reality into the larger uh, movement. It was a very important um, feminist uh, intervention. I want to speak to also two organizations that um, many people who look at the Movement for Black Lives don't hear about, and they're very much in the spirit of Ella Baker, someone who uh, I've taken many lessons from, you know, in terms of my own political uh, and organizing practice. And those organizations are uh, a team out of Brooklyn called Blackbird, and another a group of women uh, that were based in Oakland. They're spread out now a little bit uh, more, called the Blackout Collective. So Blackbird was, is uh, a team of very talented young organizers who do a lot of communications work. They do a lot of technical work for movement organizations. And we don't necessarily think of that as leadership, but it, in this day and age, in this moment of movement organizing, it's absolutely essential. And their approach to it is not to do it uh, to claim credit and celebrity, but rather to do it in a very low-key, behind-the-scenes manner, which is the, the, the Ella Baker part. Um, their motto is um, high impact, low ego, and that's pretty refreshing too. Um, the other group is the Blackout Collective, and they do tactical training. They travel around the country, and particularly in the early days uh, of some of the Black Lives Matter protests, they travel around the country 
training people how to safely do direct action. Um, and um, we're very instrumental and uh, understandably somewhat under the radar. Also a part of the origin story is um, the approach, the very conscious approach, not in practice, not just in practice, but also in words, um, of leadership. One of the critiques of the early uh, Black Lives Matter movement by a whole number of people, Oprah weighed in on this on national television, so forth, um, was that it was leaderless. Where's your leader? Where's your Martin Luther King? Where's your Malcolm X? And Patrice Kahn Cullors, who was one of the original founders of the hashtag and the network, her response was, we're not a leaderless movement, we're a leaderful movement. And by that she meant a decentralized grassroots organization training many people to step up to be leaders. And I, you know, it sort of warmed my heart because I thought of so many quotes by Ella Baker, uh, strong people don't need a strong leader, uh, and if you provide light, people will find the way. That sort of confidence that we can all be leaders and that in some ways it's a bit of a trap when we're looking for the next savior or messiah um, and this movement deliberately rejected uh, that. I remember when I, um, the other thing I want to mention in this regard is that sometimes it, even though it has been led by young activists, it is mischaracterized as simply a youth movement there have been older people involved, and people uh, in the forefront of these organizations you know, have taken direction and leadership uh, from people in, older gener in the older, generation, older generations. Um, and, and so the alliance has been more around politics than simply around age. When I interviewed people in Ferguson, they uh, had not had a very favorable view of uh, Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, and, but they had a very positive view of Angela Davis, who is actually older than Al Sharpton. So it wasn't simply an older activist versus young activist. And I said, well, why, why is that? And they said, well, uh, Reverend Sharp Sharpton came in to scold us and mold us, uh, and Angela Davis came in in a different way. So, um, so I think that's a part of understanding some of the sensibilities. Now, with regard to, to electoral work, uh, many of the activists that came out of the movement for black lives were in some ways understandably skeptical of electoral politics, skeptical of the Democratic Party. Uh, many of them felt they had put great faith in the election of the first black president, only to be disappointed that things were not transformed uh, in the wake of his election, but also that he had disappointed some of them in terms of their own um, you know, political goals. There was a particular feminist sensibility uh, around um, Obama's focus on programs like My Brother's Keeper and a kind of unwillingness to also include uh, women uh, in that. And Kimberly <laughs> Crenshaw has written very and spoken very eloquently about this. But then there was November 2016, uh, which was a bit of a wake-up call um, on so many levels. And I remember being in meetings and discussions where people were really, I'm not sure I'm going to vote, I'm not sure, you know, and I have to say this, you know, when I talk about fetishizing and romanticizing the vote, uh, sometimes people my generation and older say, you know, you, you got to get out there and vote. People died. People fought and died for you to be able to. People didn't fight and die for you to be able to vote. People fought and died so we could get a greater margin of freedom. Vote, voting is a tool and a mechanism or can be a tool and mechanism toward that freedom. But, but, but the vote itself right, doesn't necessarily, um, in fact, deliver that. But after 2016, um, we saw a number of uh, Movement for Black Lives activists, you know, this young, vibrant, uh, unapologetically black and unapologetically feminist uh, leaders taking baby steps into the electoral arena. Some people who had done that work for a while, um, you know, kind of did orientation, but they didn't just go in um, uncritically, and they didn't go in without, I would say, their whole selves. Um, from the situation in Chicago where in 2016, uh, young organizers uh, created a campaign around a particularly uh, insensitive, let's say, um, a local uh, prosecutor, Anita Alvarez, and it wasn't, so much of, it wasn't so much a question of identifying and supporting and endorsing her opposition as it was saying she had crossed a line by being insensitive to the families uh, of police violence, by not investigating, et cetera. And so it was a buy Anita campaign, buy B-Y-E, not B-U-Y, buy Anita campaign 
and there was, you know, they sort of followed her around to fundraisers. They did this massive expose. They, uh, you know, rented banners and flew them over fundraising events, and really, you know, forced her out of office. And 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 the whole frame of the debate about that election was about accountability around, um, you know, police violence and a whole range uh, of issues. And so it was entering into the electoral arena, but entering in on different terms, not simply being cheerleaders for a politician, but setting issues, setting demands, um, and introducing some new tactics um, as well. Similarly, uh, the Dream Defenders in Florida, who uh, were very influential in bringing attention to the Trayvon Martin case early on, uh, got involved in the gubernatorial uh, race of um, uh, the, um, I'm blanking on his name now. Nobody knows it. Yeah, Andrew Gilliam. Yeah, I didn't. I, I wrote his initials and forgot his name. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Gilliam, who didn't win. So if he had won, maybe I would have remembered his name. Um, Andrew Gilliam and Gilliam and worked with him very closely in the course of the campaign, but also were not uncritical and refused to give up a kind of critical lens and a critical angle on the issues that they disagreed with him on. More recently, many of uh, some of the Black Lives Matter organizers um, joined in an organization called Black Women Four, uh, which uh, came out very strongly in support of Elizabeth Warren. Similarly, uh, people involved in that same movement came out um, with a black scholar statement in support of Bernie Sanders. And so really entering in, but, but issuing statements um, and providing critical support in ways that are not typical uh, of electoral actors. One of the uh, groups, I think, that has caused optimism and, and really changed the political terrain in terms of electoral work has been the group of uh, young congresswomen uh, known as the Squad, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, Rashida Tlaib, and Ilhan Omar. Um, and many of the uh, organizations that have been a part of the Movement for Black Lives have morphed into and supported um, a new multiracial coalition called the Rising Majority, uh, which hosted an event in DC um, on uh, February 7th, which kind of talked to members of the squad in the context of talking about electoral work and movement building. And that's, and I'm on a panel tomorrow at Columbia for the Beyond the Bars conference, which is having that same conversation with some of the, um, uh, I don't want to use the word progressive, I'll use in quote progressive prosecutors because um, the question is how much will they be able to do, but some of the new progressive prosecutors who've been, and district attorneys who've been elected, um, as well as some grassroots um, activists and organizers, to begin to not see electoral work as a silo, uh, but to have it be in conversation, sometimes awkward and difficult conversation uh, with movement, um, movement organizers and movement strategists. Um, so I will just say uh, somewhat in closing that, um, you know, history doesn't repeat and we can never uh, draw too much of an analogy of a movement um, that, that, that existed and culminated 100 years ago. But there are patterns and themes, there are um, ways that we can learn from, reflect on, and notice some of the differences between. And I think when I look back at the women's suffrage movement with all of its contradictions, uh, particularly the role of uh, many outspoken black women in that movement, you know, I think of a very different kind of leadership style. One of the things that the, this generation of black feminist activists in particular uh, have done is really to eschew the politics of respectability. Uh, Ida B. Wells, of course, deployed the politics of respectability in order to earn a, a place at the table um, a, a, a place on the platform, et cetera. This uh, generation, I think, has really interrogated the class nature of respectability politics in looking at some of the victims of police violence, for example. They're not mostly college professors and doctors and lawyers. In fact, very, very rarely, they are poor and working class people. They are people on the margins of the economy or in the informal economy. Um, and these young people have said, quite radically and quite uh, democratically that their lives matter. So it's not just black lives matter, but it's those black lives who have been deemed dispensable, uh, who have been abandoned, 
uh, et cetera, that they are putting at the, at the, at the forefront. And that really um, is a shift in terms of uh, a lot of the strategies of uh, uh, dominant political, black political movements um, in the 20th century. So, um, so intersectionality, intersectionality advocates um, without apology. I'll just close with a quote from Aislinn Pulley, um, who is one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter Chicago, um, who she's actually she's well known for being the person who was invited to the White House and refused to go because she thought it was going to be a photo op. So she's very um, uh, sort of feisty and has an edge, but she um, uh, captures, I think, the spirit uh, of this movement and, this, and the black feminist praxis that is at the center of it. She says, and she's paraphrasing Fannie Lou Hamer in this, the great Mississippi uh, civil rights uh, activist. She says, no one is free till we are all free. And that includes those who are employed and those who are unemployed. Those are who are in gangs and those who are sex workers. What we are fighting for is a world where our full humanity is honored and protected and valued. And that includes all of who we are. So that is kind of the 21st century version uh, of what I think the cutting edge of feminist vision um, looks like. It is more robust and inclusive and radical, and I think that's a hopeful thing. So with that, I will segue to conversation and welcome your thoughts and comments. And welcome my colleague, Professor Alcoff, to the stage. So uh, my name is Linda Martine Alkov. I'm a professor of philosophy and women's studies here at Hunter College. And I'm very happy to be able to participate in this session and moderate um, so that we can hopefully get some of your questions and thoughts. I, I know some of my students are here tonight, so I hope you young people won't be too intimidated by this great sort of thought leader, intellectual leader, political leader <laughs> to ask uh, questions about where we go forward, and I and I want to start it start off that process with a couple of um, of maybe points and questions for you, Barbara. Um, it is good to reflect back on the suffrage movement. It was a movement, as I often tell my students, in which there was more unity around the goal that we were that women were struggling for the goal of suffrage, but there wasn't unity around the strategy to achieve that goal. Um, and that critique, that difference, that conflict among the pro-suffrage women in the United States led to a period of strong negative critique, right? Um, from people like Anna Julia Cooper and Ida B. Wells Barnett. And it's from that negative critique of the differences around the, the correct strategy to reach suffrage that the movement moved forward, that our theoretical understanding of gender moved forward, that the concept of intersectionality was invented by Anna Julia Cooper, in my view, I think. Um, and so, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of conflict or negative disagreement because it's, it's dialectical. I want to get a little dialectics in here, <laughs> right? Out of that came um, some really important uh, uh, improvements of the movement. So I, it, I wanted to raise a couple of questions for you um, to expand a little bit beyond what you uh, gave us tonight. Um, one is, since you raised the electoral issue, I know we don't want to fetishize the vote. I really agree with this. I mean, the, the electoral arena is an arena of ideological struggle. It's a struggle over the public discourse, what can be said, what can the word socialism enter in without get making people like go completely bananas, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a... Uh, it's got a lot of things going on in that electoral arena besides the question of the vote. And I wanted, because I've heard you speak on this um, so well, but I wanted to raise, not to get into the partisan question of who we're going to vote for uh, primarily, but the more general question raised by the current election as it's playing out. 
and that is the role of our identities in electoral politics. And I know you know how important it is to have an African American candidates, to have female candidates. This is not unimportant. This is critically important. But I know that you support Bernie. <laughs> and so I, w I wondered if, if I could ask you to, to she reflect. She said we weren't going there. And <laughs> <laughs> well, in light of that, I mean, uh, I, I support Bernie too, but, but the, the question I, I want to raise here is the more general question for the, all of the public to, to think about. How do we think about the role of the social identity of candidates in relationship to other considerations we have about them, right? Their agenda and so forth. Is there a way in which we can affirm the importance of the identity um, but not make it the only consideration? I mean, how, how, do we, how do we sort of help? You know, sometimes the journalists, they really need some help, right? <laughs> help them understand how to, how to, you know, how to chew gum and, and walk at the same time, how to think about the multiple considerations without letting one of them drop, right? Without saying that it doesn't matter what the identity is. That's one question. The other question. Well, that's, that's three questions. Okay. <laughs> but do you want to take? I have to take notes to remember. Yeah, do let's you, let's talk about what you've. I'm going to comment on your comments. And like, um, no, I love that's very rich, and I would love to hear some of your thoughts on these things, of course. Um, but I, I want to. There's three things you mentioned that I want to respond to before I, for, you know, before we start talking about something else. And the one thing you said about about struggle and conflict and tension within. Movements. I mean, Ida B. Wells, for example, was very critical of some of the white women suffragists, suffragettes that she, you know, worked alongside of, and then continued to work with them. Right. So, so difference. I mean, there are principled and unprincipled, you know, points of unity. Right. That sometimes people are in uh, political, you know, formations together, and it's 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 relationships of convenience rather than principle struggle. We would say. Uh, but but those tensions often yield new understandings, new strategies, et cetera. So I just want to underscore that. I don't think I did so uh, very much in the talk. And the other is about um, the electoral arena and how we see it. And I really do think um, for those of us who are concerned with structural change and have a sort of long, trying to have a long-term vision of it, um, I do think we have to recalibrate notions of winning. Like you may actually lose an election but you have shifted the discourse in a certain way. You've set the stage for another round. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, victories that can come out of what might seem to be, you know, what might literally be an electoral defeat. I'm not, you know, I, I want the people who I think are the best candidates to win, but I also want to be realistic. And I think there are a lot of conversations right now about, you know, Elizabeth Warren, for example, and, and some of the young people I work with who supported her. Uh, what does it mean that she's pulled out, but what, what has she also contributed even though she's not still in, in the game. And just to answer your question about identity, uh, one of the things I think is, is impressive, and they are not perfect, the current movements. I'm not trying to say, you know, young people got it. We can just all relax. Uh, but, but one thing I think is important is a more sophisticated notion of identity and of representational politics, right? Because you notice most of the young progressive organizers were not swept away by the people of color candidates. I mean, Juan Castro maybe got more attention, but Kamala Harris and Cory Booker did not really win young progressives, young left progressives in the black community. So it was really a question of what do you stand for um, and not simply who you are, with your caveat being absolutely true. You know, we, you know, we don't want uh, to go back to the bad old days you know, of all white Congress and all white Senate and all white city councils. On the other hand, we want to be very savvy post Ob Obama and in the age of Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, you know, that simply, you know, having a person that, that comes from a particular group doesn't mean that a political agenda of that community is going to be advanced. Thank you. That's great. The, the, the second question I want to raise to you, you know, I'm a philosopher, so I have the luxury of being able to ask big questions, but, but I'm I just a little old historian. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to draw you into the category of citizenship a little bit. 
um, which is another part that we wanted to foreground. You know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I'm not from the United States originally. And that's one thing that's interesting. For, th for those of us from other countries, you know, socialists run for, for, for elections all the time. Communists are on the ballot. Fascists are on the ballot. I mean, you know, it's a broad array out there, and it doesn't make, you know, democracy stop. Um, so I'm, I'm originally from, from Panama, and you know, now they're talking about stripping citizenship from some people, which is a form of voter suppression, right? Because if you can, you can strip citizenship from those who've been naturalized, and there's already a stripping of citizenship rights in the voter suppression that's going on across the country. But, you know, this category of citizenship, we take for granted that, of course, only citizens should be able to vote. Should we take that for granted? You know, who is worthy of citizenship? How do we talk about who is worthy of citizenship? That's a discussion going on today. That's a discussion about stripping naturalized citizens. I mean, in the old days, they used to think only European Americans were worthy of citizenship. Some people still think that today. There's a discussion about you have to have valuable skills that can make money to be worthy of citizenship. Is that really the case? Should you have to be a Christian <laughs> to be worthy of citizenship? And, you know, this kind of discussion, even when it hasn't come to resolution, this kind of discussion in the public airwaves, I think, leads a lot of marginalized groups, like Latinx groups and others, to try to prove their citizenship, to pr try to prove their citizen worthiness, right? And by which they might join the military, right? They might avoid demonstrations. They might avoid radical criticisms because they, they feel like they have to rise to a certain bar to prove their citizenship to be worthy of the vote. And it you know, really raises the question that we never have in this country. What makes for a good citizen? Why does citizenship have to be earned only by some, while others assume it as their right? As a, it's kind of like an intergenerational wealth transfer, right, of settler colonialism that has happened, in which you have a whole constituency of people who are citizens today. But you know, what was their worth to gain that citizenship? Um, it's kind of, you know, the legacy of citizenship is from settler colonialism, and so we have to, like, um, think about that and realize that some, some groups we take as having an unquestionable right to citizenship, and others we don't. And what are the real grounds for doing that? So the question, I guess, is really, then this is the big question, the, you know, the philosophical question. Should citizenship or one's paper status, you know, having papers, really be the ticket to democratic participation. It's not the case everywhere around the world. And in, in some parts of Latin America, there's um, experiments to try to say, everybody who shares a space, right? They share a water supply. They share natural resources. They share, you know, a certain political condition they should be able to participate in the decision making about that constituency. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's yeah. sort of the big question. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot in there. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, with the Elsa Barkley Brown example, I mean, that raises some of these questions, right? People who are in transition from uh, being enslaved to being quasi free are saying, you know, we make up the rules. So a little kid 11 years old gets to say, I think we should vote this way. And a woman who's not legally enfranchised gets to say, I think this is how we should cast our vote. So that notion of a collective ballot as opposed to an individual, you know, transcends all these kinds of barriers that you're talking about. And of course, it's not just Latinx community in terms of undocumented. You've got Haitians and African immigrants and uh, all kinds of residents, people in our political family and in our communities who are not, uh, you know, uh, allowed to, yeah, you know, who are not allowed to exercise the rights of citizenship. But I also want to say that there's there's legal citizenship, and then there's always been, especially you know, in 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 black communities, there's always been the unwritten uh, second class citizenship. Like what you know, you can have the right on paper, but if you um, have to always prove 
that you are a citizen if you always have to prove that you are upstanding, et cetera. You know, there's this upstanding citizen moniker that also suggests that some people, you're here, you might have papers, you might not have papers, but are you really a good citizen, an upstanding citizen, a patriotic citizen? And that has always been a set of, of criteria that I think steeped in settler colonialism, steeped in racism, steeped in patriarchy that restrict even the legal, ex you know, this, the, 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 the exercise of legal rights of citizenship. You know, May Nye talks interestingly uh, you know, about, about this, um, you know, as a historian, but I always, you know, I think about, you know, when you talk globally, I think about at this moment the number of stateless people in the world. I mean, we may critique the state, but to be stateless in a world of nation states is a level of vulnerability. Citizens of where? Where, where do you lay the claims? Where do you, you know, where do you even lay human right, basic human rights claims? You know, 65 million uh, people uh, because of war and empire building, you know, have been forced to, and, and climate, uh, have been forced to, you know, pack up little bundles and, and head off somewhere. Uh, so, so where, you know, what claims do they have on what entity, you know, citizens claim, claim, make claims to, to a government, to a state, to a country. So, you know, that's another level of, I think, our kind of moral obligation to think beyond the bounds of traditional citizenship. And of course, the prison industry, you know, the fact that, um, People who are incarcerated, uh, for the most part, there are a few states, but for the most part, uh, do not exercise the vote. And many disenfranchised um, uh, people who were formerly incarcerated, who had committed felonies, we decide, we decide, I didn't decide, not us, but you know, um, those people are defined outside the bounds of citizenship and a certain set of rights that we think of as fundamental, and, and that has to be interrogated. Thank you, I knew she could go there. <laughs> So let's open You keep this. asking the socialism question, too. I don't know if you want to. <laughs> Do you want to say something about that? <laughs> um, I mean, he calls himself a democratic socialist, and they always drop. And that's an important distinction, historically and philosophically, as you know. Yeah. Um, it's a longer conversation. I mean, you know, part of my work on Islanda Robeson was uh, looking at the ravages of the Cold War and McCarthyism on... Um, on her family, uh, the wife of Paul Robeson, on her family and on a whole generation of folks who either were socialists and communists or were associated with socialists or communists or were thought to be socialists and communists, um, you know, who lost their jobs, who were harassed, who, you know, just suffered enormously. And so when I hear the kind of red baiting of somebody like, like Bernie Sanders, I mean, you know, there are echoes of that and I think it's a very dangerous and slippery slope. Now, it also speaks to kind of sometimes our ignorance about you know different political categories. I mean, Bernie Sanders really much more resembles a social democrat in a European sense than uh, than a revolutionary socialist, let's say. Uh, so, but but people just lump it all together and, and don't don't mind with the distinction. So, anyway. So, who'd like to uh, be a part of this conversation? Yeah, we have some mics going around, so uh, here we go. What, you want to identify and yourself? All, uh, other conference participants can pipe in and give some answers, too. Yes. Hello. Dr. Yeah. Gilmore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so my name's Mohammed. I'm a Hunter College student. I was just wondering, since you were talking about citizenship, how do you think it's going to evolve moving forward, given all the like gender and race considerations that we've been discussing? How is citizenship going to evolve? Yeah, at least in the U.S. I don't know. I mean, I think that question is embedded in a larger question in terms of where, you know, where is, you know, the imperfect, flawed democracy that has existed in this country headed? Um, I think it is in crisis, but I think it was pretty imperfect to begin with. Uh, but I think, you know, to be blunt, I think that there is a kind of proto-fascist threat, you know, which is to say many of the... Um, markers of a sort of democracy, a capitalist democracy, um, as some would describe as a, a liberal, a, a bourgeois democracy, are being eroded, and they're important. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, you know, I think, so if we go in that direction, citizenship technically means less and less, because citizens can be 
detained citizens can, if you, you know, any dictatorship around the world, you know, citizens can be detained. Uh, you don't have right or access to information through a, uh, media and, you know, it, it is a very different experience of what it means to be a citizen, even though one would technically be a citizen. So I think for me that question is embedded in a larger set of very um, questions that keep me up at night, quite frankly, you know, about where this country is, is, is headed. Um, uh, yes, um, the question was asked, and then the question was repeated. So I would like to propose an answer, and I would like to hear if you would uh, agree with that answer. I would like to uh, propose that, um, uh, yes, I believe uh, citizen citizenship uh, should uh, constantly be um, uh, questioned, and uh, you should everybody should uh, make efforts to prove uh, their worthiness for being a citizen. And I would like to propose maybe uh, volunteer work uh, uh, for um, uh, some approved activity for everyone, not just uh, new citizens, but all citizens, every citizen, so that uh, they could maybe work together and uh, sort of like create a uh, inclusionary kind of spirit in the country instead of uh, constantly trying to prove uh, which exclusions are approved and which exclusions should be uh, constantly looked at. That's um, I mean, if you talk about citizenship as being membership in a nation, right, in a country. So there's rights and obligations. We have a lot of oblig. We talk about rights of citizens. We do actually have a lot of obligations um, as citizens. I, I don't know about compulsory volunteer work. I mean, um, I think it, you know one thing that's been debated is more controversial is is, is compulsory uh, voting, right? Because we have a lot of people don't vote. Like, what would that mean? And I, I'm not sure where I land on that. Uh, either. Uh, I think we need to do a lot to revitalize our public sphere, uh, to revitalize the way in which we forge community. Um, I don't want to talk about volunteerism in an abstract because I think we've, you know, we've seen the erosion of public spaces and commons and, and places where we come together and feel like this is the community I'm a part of, therefore I want to volunteer for it. Like that's the big project to change that not to, for somebody to, in this sometimes very um, artificial way, decide you know, one day they're going to go to a poor community uh, and, and, and serve in the soup kitchen and then you know, get out of there before dark. Uh, but I think sort of creating a bigger commons is it maybe still in the spirit of what you're suggesting, and I'm, I'm very much for that. I, I just add, some countries do have that. In Germany, you'd have to do a year of service, and it's better than doing military service, uh, which, which, <laughs> which other countries have. Israel has, for example. So, and it does. Uh, it could be. You can see how it could be misused in this country in particular ways, but it it could also uh, recast the subjectivity of what it means to be a part of a collective, and and work against some of the the individualism of our particular society. Uh, do you see the possibility that Elizabeth Warren would be the Democratic vice presidential candidate? Well, you know, just um, uh, one of, I, I think Ro, um, his name, Ro Khanna. Ro Khanna. Why am I, I'm blanking on names tonight. I have too many names in my head. Ro Khanna. Uh, said on, I don't know if it was Rachel Maddow or, or, um, or CNN that he would think that Elizabeth Warren would be a great running mate for Bernie. I, I don't know if they're, what terms they're on. I don't know, uh, you know, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I think about that. Um, I, I, I actually advocated early on, uh, I mean, we're talking about this now, so, um, you know that they should that they should in some way join forces. Um, there are significant differences uh, between them, but there you know there was a um, there are very different constituencies. What? No, I'm just telling. Oh. Uh, okay. Um, 
so I, you know, I think a, a consolidation of those forces would be very interesting. I'm not sure if the political advisors that pay more attention to polls than I do uh, would think that would be viable. I'm not sure where she is at um, right now, um, and doesn't seem like she's she would be necessarily amenable. She's a damn good debater, though. <laughs> she did. She tore Bloomberg up, didn't she? <laughs> Okay, so do you believe, I'd like to know why you're supporting Bernie Sanders, um, but also the interesting thing is, yes, uh, he's, you know, galvanized a movement, but it's one thing running and galvanizing a movement, and it's another thing governing. Mm -hmm. So do you believe, since you are a Bernie Sanders supporter, self-identify, um, and it's been terrific that there's been a, a, a movement grown, although, Unfortunately, the turnout of youth, even though he says that the youth turnout is big, it hasn't really grown since 2016, despite yeah, it. So there's the three questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there are. Mm -hmm. But the three questions is, okay, is a movement, uh, is great, uh, but in terms of electing someone who's going to make solutions and practically push through things and govern, is this um, the best you know, candidate? Mm -hmm. I think the transition from a movement candidate or a movement in general to governing is a difficult transition. It is for everybody. But I'll tell you, I put more faith in somebody that comes out of a movement, especially a movement of you know tough, committed, smart people, a lot of them young feminists, a lot of them uh, serious organizers, than I do someone that just comes out of a campaign that is orchestrating the next career move for a career politician. So I think there are challenges for both. You know, I was very involved in the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and uh, in some ways, the way things have evolved in South Africa breaks my heart uh, because it, we had dreamed much bigger of what the solution would be. But I think um, the ANC had, had this dilemma as a part, an opposition party that fought against the apartheid regime for so many years and then to become a governing party. Uh, there's a is a difficult transition. I would hope that a Bernie Sanders, and you know, again, to me, it's not, I'm not, Bernie Sanders is not my savior. I'm not in love with Bernie Sanders. <laughs> it's a platform, it is a movement, it's a set of principles, right? And so I would hope that he is smart enough to have other people running key offices, to have other talent in the room, and I, and I, and I think he would be. I mean, I think partly because of his age and partly because, he, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a pragmatist on a certain level, too. So I think that I could imagine, you know, a cabinet that would be, would, would compensate for what he might not have and would be focused on policy, would be focused on governance um, in ways that as an individual he may not, uh, uh, you know, step into all of that in the same kind of way. So. Yeah, um, I just want to go back to the issue of low voter turnout. Uh, which is such a huge problem historically. Uh, and of course, voter suppression plays a role in that, but it yeah. seems also there's a uh, wave, uh, it's not even a wave, it's a constant um, sense of disaffection. Just, a, a, you know, when you talk to people and, and you get the sense that they just really believe their vote doesn't matter. And it's kind of compelling what they say. Maybe their vote doesn't matter that much. So do you, do you think that's a problem, and then how do you feel we should be addressing it? Yeah, I, I do think it's a problem. Um, I think that, that sometimes we have kind of, um, you know, a simple view and, and, a, and, and not a very generous view of people who, don't, who choose not to vote in certain elections. Um, you know, some of the communities that I've worked in and with People have a good reason to be cynical, right? That they have voted and have been promised things and demanded things and simply not seen politicians uh, deliver it pretty, pretty, uh, pretty systematically. Now, uh, I argue with them that yes, we ought to participate and we, you know, the movements that I work with, we have a vote plus strategy. If all you do is vote, that's not enough. If you don't vote, very bad things can happen. So, um, and we, we, we see examples of that. So I do think it's a question of, of I don't want to just say apathy. I think it's a question of distrust. Uh, some of that trust has to be rebuilt, but also some of that trust is going to occur when we see certain kinds of shifts 
in the electoral arena in terms of politicians breaking out of a business as usual uh, uh, mold of making promises that they don't keep and you know, really looking to make some fundamental structural changes like the Electoral College, for example. I mean, I think this opens up a lot of people begin to see the political system in a different way. But there are a lot of entrenched forces that are very much against that. So I'm not sure it's going to happen. I'm a left-leaning Cuban-American from Miami, so as you can assume, my family is incredibly disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of arguments at uh, lot dinner table. A lot of arguments every dinner table. Um, and so, especially after the comments that Bernie made about Castro, um, tempers have flared. And what I'm trying to get them to understand is that all I see is abuse of power under the guise of a more palatable ideology and uh, I'm trying to get them to look towards the future as opposed to being so entrenched in the past. As I'm sure you know, Cubans vote by party since the Bay of Pigs. Um, and I was curious if you had any recommendations on how I could um, start a conversation. <laughs> and drag me into your family uh, political <laughs> fights. My brother-in-law is Cuban also, um, uh, but a very left-leaning black Cuban. Um, so. I don't know, you know, the, the issue of Cuba is, is I think, a part of what we need to talk about in terms of how we assess 20th century socialist experiments that failed. Um, that certain things were um, advanced in Cuba, if people can read, you know, healthcare, that I've gotten treatment from Cuban doctors that throughout the Caribbean, uh, and, you know, doctors were sent all over Africa. So Cuba has made a contribution uh, since the revolution, and um, and then it's failed on in some things. You know, I mean, there is still racism in Cuba, despite the you know progress on that, and and there's homophobia and as you know as policy, and and some of that's changing, but um, but I don't think we have to say any political experiment is perfect in order to learn from it. And I think one of the thing about sort of 20th century socialist experiments is striking that balance between making a transition when you know the world is against you, right, versus devolving into um, uh, a governance uh, practice that is fundamentally undemocratic, right? How do you maintain democracy and still make transitions uh, in the economy that will make it more egalitarian, that will make it fairer, that will you know, deal with the, the uh, in, in our case, the obscenity of the wealth uh, disparity that exists. We'll use the resources, you know, for human beings instead of, you know, for the accumulation of wealth. And just, I just want to say something, too, about the sort of billionaire discussion. I mean, we do, I think we do, I think the left, which I consider myself part of, um, needs to interrogate mistakes made in, in socialist countries without being defense. That, like, that's how we learn. Obvious mistakes have been made in, in a lot of places. And I think some, there's a pattern of some certain kind of mistakes. But let's be clear, you know, capitalism is not working for a lot of working people. Uh, people are working multiple jobs in order to survive, even when the, you know, the economic numbers and the employment numbers look good. The quality of life is very, very difficult. Um, and I have, you know, like 20 books on my shelf about the crisis of capitalism, not the cyclical crisis, but a very fundamental crisis of capitalism. And some of them from capital, you know, written by capitalists, like Mark Benioff, you know, from Salesforce, had this big piece in the New York Times. Uh, and it started off, I'm a billionaire, capitalism's been good to me, but capitalism as we know it is dead. You know, Robert Reich's Capitalism and How to Save It. I mean, there is a certain crisis of capitalism which we can't answer without looking at, with some openness, uh, what socialist alternatives have proposed, achieved, and how they, you know, and what they haven't achieved. So, I don't know if you can say all that to your people, but. Uh. <laughs> Let me just weigh in real quickly on that point, because I grew up in Florida, and I know that the, the Cuban population in Florida is actually mixed. It's not politically uniform. The younger generation is mixed. The Mari Elito, um, yeah. you know, people who came over are different from the ones earlier. The issue is that the, the uh, very conservative Cubans control the police and the city government and the newspaper. So you get this in political institutions. So you get this sense that that's the Cuban vote. But a majority of Cubans in Miami thought that Eliana should 
Eliana Gonzalez should go back to Cuba, should be allowed to go back to Cuba. So it's, it's more diverse than, than we might realize. People remember who he was. Yeah, the little boy. And you know, what Bernie said, he, he said the mildest thing possible about Cuba, illiteracy, and then he immediately pivoted, and I think this is what they didn't like, he immediately pivoted to saying, we have to admit that there are some things the United States has done in foreign policy that are not good. And that's, a, that's the, the self-criticism uh, that they don't want to allow. So we can take two more questions here, and then we're going to um, go to reception. Yes. I just want to go back to the I just wanted to go back to the seventies for a second. Um, I was young then, and uh, me too. <laughs> and I remember being in a car g in Los Angeles, my first trip out of New York, and um, really getting very excited about Angela Davis, and um, followed everything about She's her since speaking then. While we're speaking, I know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I just look back then, and there were the people who ran the movements, who seemed to be much more coordinated with the people than in government to get something done. I mean, you can go back to the 60s, right? You, you say what you will about who was running the government. It was a partnership between LBJ, Martin Luther King, activists outside that got something done in government that, that really changed a lot of what was happening. It seems to me now that we don't have any integration between people who are in government and people who are in movements. You feel like you have to be in one or the other. I mean, I know that for myself, being a community activist, I don't want to run for office because I think that ties your hands and puts you in a structure that really stops change from happening. And when people are in movements, they have a, a freedom to say what they want without worrying about, like, you know, Bernie's entitled to his opinions, but if you want to get elected, you know, say you're a socialist, do you get in? And, and, and it just seems to me that there is a lack of thought about how the government works. I mean, you can you want to change it, whatever, but in order to change it, unless you want to have a revolution, and that's a scary word in the United States of America, you have to work within the framework. And it just seems, whether it's the Twitter universe or whatever, everybody wants change and they want it now. And in my experience and all the things that I've gone through watching women who I don't f feel have made a tremendous amount of progress in, work, in the work world and the government world since I've been a teenager, mm -hmm. I don't really feel that a lot has happened, is very difficult to see people, young people today and just be so turned off immediately by things not going their way. And I don't know how well, we change that. I think that was that. true in the 60s, too. I mean, <laughs> people were very impatient for change in the 60s. I mean, there's different, you know, in each generation, it's hard to make huge generalizations. I think, you know, the 60s and 70s generation, there were people who were, you know, working in government and so forth, and then there were people who were calling for overthrowing the government. So, and I think you have a spectrum today, you know, there's a continuum. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that King and LBJ were, you know, working arm in arm. I mean, no, there's enormous I'm not, tension, I'm not saying including that, but you know, J. Edgar Hoover spying on him. Well, but <laughs> no, but I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I want to answer it seriously. Um, but I also think the thing about young people. I mean, I ha part what has been most rewarding and most difficult in the last five years of my political practice is to be, and I'm not an elder, so don't anybody go out of here saying that. <laughs> I'm a Yelda, which is a young elder, um, <laughs> in these spaces, and I, you know, I I have the privilege of listening to them, and th they are very serious. I mean, I disagree sometimes, but um, you know, the the young people in Florida who who worked on uh, Gillum's campaign, uh, they they were all in. They were understanding how it worked. They worked for around the felony disenfranchisement. The young people in Chicago worked to get out the D, you know, get the DA out. I think also, and, I, and people probably have different opinions about this, but you know, the Justice Democrats and the work that uh, people who are really creating more of a left wing in the Democratic Party, which has not existed for a long time, that is taking electoral work very seriously. Um, you know, b building out and, and primarying people who've been in for a long time, who are, who are a part of a kind of machine of electoral politics, challenging them and knowing what the rules are to be able to challenge them. 
I mean, I, you know, in Chicago, I mean, I get invited to a electoral fundraiser like every other day. Um, so they are, they are, they are trying. I think they are taking seriously, and I think sometimes we don't, maybe we don't see that, or we just, you know, we see from a distance, or we hear the loudest voice, or something. But I think there's real strategizing going on, and I, you know, some of the biggest and and most um, exhilarating conversations have been around this question of the connection between electoral work and movement work. The, the event we had at Howard University that I mentioned before on um, February 7th with the, the members of the squad, it was a room full of activists and them talking about you know, what they're doing, what they can and can't do, how they feel about issues of accountability versus defending them, because sometimes we get politicians in, we say, we want you to be accountable, but then when they actually do what communities and movements want them to do, we, we, we're like, okay, fine. We don't know what defending and supporting means as well. So I agree with you, there needs to be more back and forth, um, but there also are some healthy tensions that I, I think we can appreciate too, as a dialectic. Yeah, last question. And a shorter answer maybe, huh? Imagine that a president oh, is right. elected Sorry. and a Senate and a House such that there is a possibility of doing some big marquee progressive things. Would and they called you the <laughs> during the <laughs> interim before swearing in and said, We're considering three possibilities. A law, a national law about reproductive rights, or a serious beginning of reparations for slavery. Mm. Or <laughs> the ERA, because Virginia or some state just reads there's what would you recommend <laughs> they do? Let's, let, we'll, let's answer that over drinks in the reception. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, this whole idea of a holistic movement approach that so we have a, this rising majority organization, we have indigenous uh, folks doing indigenous rights organizing around climate. We've got people, uh, you know, undocumented folks doing immigration rights. Uh, we have people doing um, reproductive justice work. I mean, for most of those people, you come in through an issue, but as we grow and mature politically, I want to be ambitious for all my people, right? And I want to be ambitious for all those um, freedom dreams that I have, which are not just one. And so I think, you know, if you have an administration and if you have a Congress and a Senate that has the will to do some really transformative change, um, then you don't have to pick and choose this thing or that thing, that it's a, that, that you have a consistent set of changes, you know, that will occur and all those things, um, you know, should be on the table. I mean, you didn't mention climate too. Like I'm <laughs> seriously afraid um, uh, if we don't do some, some kind of rational uh, and aggressive climate intervention. Um, so. We have a reception waiting for us. So in, in the and the conference tomorrow, I'm getting, I'm getting. Do you want to stand up and say anything about it? We have a full day. You have to look at the program. It's an amazing set of speakers. Thank you to the audience for participating in the discussion. Thank you to Barbara.